If I were to ask you, what's the one place that, that you try to avoid at all costs? What, what would you say? Think about that. Maybe for some of you it's cold weather, and that's why you live down here in Texas, because you just avoid cold weather at all costs. Uh, maybe for others of you it's certain restaurants, and if you're with some people and they suggest a certain restaurant, all of a sudden you came down with some sort of sickness because you just don't want to go there. Um, for, for, for college students, oftentimes it's, it's class. You know, it's that 7.30 in the morning class, and, and there's always an excuse. Something comes up where they're not able to, to make that class. For me, it's the waiting room at a dentist or a doctor's office. I don't know what it is, but if I have an 8.30 appointment, it's 9 o'clock, and I'm still sitting in the waiting room, and this just seems to happen all the time. And so I have to really decide you know, is this doctor's appointment or is this dentist's appointment really worth it? Do I really need to go or can this be put off till, till some later point? But we all have these places, don't we? These places and these things that we avoid at all cost. There was a February 2012 article in Wired magazine that details a new discovery that scientists are calling the forgetting pill. The experiment began by testing it on rats and it's a pill that helps you forget. Now, the first question I have is, how do they know if the rats forgot or if it's just not a very smart rat? And, and, and what memories are we erasing here? Is it the time that they took the cheese from the mousetrap? But anyways, investors are funding this experiment, and, and research is being done because they're hoping that they'll be able to do the same thing with humans. That, that if we go through something that's really tough and something that's really difficult, that we can just take a pill and we'll forget it. That's what's being researched. Now, I think there are times when we as believers have to stand at odds against our culture. And there are messages that are sent in our culture, and, and they're not always explicit. Sometimes they're, they're underneath the surface. But we as believers have to live distinctly different from these messages. And this idea that we are to run from any sort of pain or any sort of struggle that we experience is a message that our culture sends all the time. It's all around us. Turn on the TV and you see commercial after commercial of, of all these different pills that we can take and places that we can go to that will help us experience life to the fullest, that will help us escape our pain, that will help us get away from, from, the, from the suffering of this world. The only problem is, Scripture paints a very different picture of the path of suffering. And this morning, I want to talk about the concept of stay. What does it mean for us as believers to stay? Because our culture teaches us over and over again in subversive ways that whenever we struggle, whenever times get tough, whenever the pain comes, is that we run. We, we get away from it. When the relationship we're in starts getting tough, we run. When, when the church we're involved in does something that, that we don't like or, or somebody says something that we don't care for, we run. When the job just isn't working out and the boss is a jerk, we run. And as a culture, we become experts at running from everything. That anytime there's a struggle in front of us or suffering in our path, we'll do anything to avoid it. Just like me in the doctor's waiting room. We, we want to escape it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but suffer for his sake. And it seems there are these moments in our life where the path ahead of us is a path of suffering. And instead of staying, instead of experiencing what God would have for us in that moment, instead of trying to understand what the Lord is doing, we just take the forgetting pill. We just want to take the pill. We want to escape from it. We want to get away from it. And when you look at Scripture, it feels like there are these two incompatible truths that, that are sitting side by side over and over again in the New Testament. Because whenever suffering is mentioned in the New Testament, oftentimes it's followed by talking about glory. And they seem like complete opposites. It seems like this shouldn't be. But they're repeated side by side again and again in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 says, For it was fitting that he, 
for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Suffering and glory side by side. And we see this over and over again in the New Testament. And suffering is what we're called to endure. I would define endurance by saying endurance is long-term obedience in the same direction. I talk about this with our college students, and I say that we're to do what's right even when it's hard. We endure. We have this long-term obedience in the same direction even when suffering is before us. And glory is what we receive. It's the prize that's set before us. It's the glory of God. It's the moment we stand in the presence of Almighty God and we see Him in all of His glory. These two principles stand side by side, not only in the letters of the New Testament, but also in the narratives as well. Even if we go back to Jesus' birth in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, it says this, Now when they had departed, behold, speaking of the wise men here, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under. Now, that's not the part of the story that you read your kids on Christmas morning. That's not the part of the story that that, that I like to stay and read and reflect on, right? That's not the comfortable part. But it's reality, it's happening. In this moment of absolute glory, the moment where God came to earth and took on flesh. He was born in a manger. The wise men are still in awe that they had seen the Savior. The star of Bethlehem is still shining. It might be a little dimmer, but it's still shining. The gifts of the wise men are still sitting there. The glory of this moment is amazing, but in the shadow of that, there's genocide. I mean, can you imagine living in a community where the government says that that all boys two years old and under will be killed? I mean, that is dark, dark stuff. And so you have this moment where where there's the glory of God, of God coming to earth, the, the glory of the light that had come into a dark place, but right beside it is suffering. And it seems like that shouldn't be right. It seems like that that shouldn't be in there. We want to read over that part. We want to skip over that part. But the fact is, no matter how bright his glory shines here upon the earth, no matter how big of a glimpse we get to receive of who he is, there is a shadow that is cast over this earth, and it is the shadow of sin and death and suffering. It is the shadow that was created when Adam committed the first sin and committed the the first step in disobeying God. There was a dark shadow that was cast in that moment. And we don't like to think about it. We don't like to talk about it. But there is a darkness that is present in our world. Job chapter 8 verse 9 says, For our days on earth are but a shadow. Matthew chapter 4 verse 16, the very metaphor that Matthew uses to describe Jesus is as a light in a dark place. He says the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, On them a light has dawned, and that light was Jesus. There's a shadow, and these two incompatible principles of suffering and glory are side by side, because that is the reality that we live in as followers of Jesus Christ. We live in the in-between of the glory that is around the corner and awaits us, and the shadow that is cast in this world. And so in 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter dives into suffering in a very real and deep way. And this is the text where we're going to land this morning. It's 1 Peter chapter 4. And as Peter talks about suffering, he is talking to a community of scattered believers. 
These believers have experienced pain and persecution. And Peter begins to talk to them about their trials. He talks to them about what they're going through and and, and why we experience suffering and, and why there's a path set before us that includes suffering. And when Peter begins to search his mind for for someone who has suffered, he points to Jesus. Isn't why we suffer the question we always ask? I mean, if we were to ever stop and slow down enough that that we're not running from our suffering and and we're not running from our pain and, and we're not filling our lives with so much busyness that we try to avoid it, isn't that the question that we ask? It's just why. Why is this suffering happening? Why is this pain set before me? Why is there hurt? Why is there brokenness? Why is there this this darkness that's here? And so Peter addresses that. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of His Word this morning. And so Peter says right off the bat, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the trials that you're going through. Now, he's not talking about some guys who got laid off from their jobs. He, he's not talking about a relational conflict that exists between two people. He's talking about Christians who are being burned. We're talking about followers of Christ who are being fed to lions, who are being used as human torches to light the street. I mean, these are the things that are happening, and Peter says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the trials that are facing you. Because the first thing we see is that when we stay, we mature. When we stay in those moments of suffering, when we experience what God has for us, there is a maturing that happens in our hearts and in our lives. I believe that most of us in here could say that the times that we've grown the most have been the times of our greatest trials. I know for me, I can remember times where the only thing that I had to hold on to was Christ and His grace. That there was such pain in my life and in my heart that that I had to reach out to Him and I had to seek Him every moment of every day. I had to trust Him every moment of every day. And as I look back now, those are the moments in my life where my faith has grown the most. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And when we suffer, through the grace of God, he will restore, he will strengthen, he will comfort, he will establish you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, though it is refined by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is a refining that happens when we suffer. There are changes that happen when we stay. There is a maturing that takes place in our lives when we stay. The second principle that Peter introduces us to in verse 13 is that when we stay, we identify with Christ. And isn't that what we're called to do as believers, as Christians? That we want to walk as he walked, we want to live as he lived, and so we want to identify with Christ. We want to know him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 says, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Rejoice when you suffer, because when we suffer, we're like Christ. And I don't think a lot of churches are proclaiming that message. 
I don't know many Christians who are praying that they can identify with Christ and his sufferings so that his glory might be revealed. We just don't get that concept. Because we want to get away, we we want to run, we want to escape, we want to avoid it at all costs. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, speaking of Jesus, says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And so when we suffer, when we struggle, when times get tough and we are forced to stay in that moment of pain, we learn obedience as Christ learned obedience. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs with God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. If we're going to call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, we need to share in His sufferings. If we're going to walk as He walked, if we're going to live as He lived, then we are going to suffer. Pain will come. But Jesus is is given to us as this picture of endurance, this picture of long-term obedience in the same direction, this picture of a follower of God who was willing to do anything to stay on the right path, even when that path led to suffering, even when that path led to a cross, he was willing to endure. He is the picture of someone who stayed. Because can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus, as he's there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was going to be killed, if he would have decided to take the forgetting pill? If he would have said, no, I'm not going to stay. I'm going to avoid this. I'm going to escape from this. I'm going to get away from this. But no, he said, I'm going to stay. And I know the path that's set before me, and I know it's a path of suffering. Because in Jesus, the third thing we see is that when we stay, glory is right around the corner. And that's why we keep walking. That's why we keep moving forward as believers, even when the path gets difficult, even when the times get tough. We keep moving because Jesus kept moving. And the truth of the matter is, we need a message of triumph over the shadows. We need it now the same way they did when Jesus was born and Matthew said, a light has come into the darkness. We need a story of triumph over the shadows. And we need to know that when Jesus put the cross upon his back, and as he walked to that hill, and as he took the beating, and as he took the mocking and the pain of the cross, that glory was right around the corner. And that cross, which represents the ultimate sign of suffering, the ultimate sign of pain, the ultimate sign of brokenness, and everything that's wrong with this world, is the greatest victory we've ever achieved. Because glory is right around the corner. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Our suffering, our light and temporary suffering does not compare to the glory that is around the corner because it far outweighs them all. Because suffering does two things. One is it softens our hearts towards others. I don't know about you, but but when we suffer, our hearts become tender towards other people who are suffering. And in that time, we are able to meet needs and love as Christ would love and experience pain and really understand the things people are walking through because our hearts are softened towards others who are suffering. Not only are our hearts softened towards others, but our hearts are also hardened. Our hearts are hardened to the things of this world. Because when we begin to understand that the glory that awaits us far outweighs anything we walk through here on earth, we become hardened to the things of this world. Our hearts begin to say, like the old hymn, that the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And the things of this world, they just don't matter as much. Because the glory that's right around the corner far outweighs any suffering I could walk through here. Because there's going to be a day when I stand in the presence of Almighty God and that glory awaits us. So the message this morning is to endure. It's a call for us to to stop running from all the things that, that we have to deal with. It's a call for us to experience what the Lord has for us. It's a call to stay. And when we ask ourselves the question, should I stay or should I go? We stay. 
Because we can run. We've all run before. We, we can quit. We can hide from it. We can turn our pain into busyness so, so that we forget and, and fill our lives with all kinds of stuff so that we don't have to deal with, with the pain that we're walking through. Or we can turn to self-pity. We can make it all about us and, and we, can, we can make it how, how we're not deserving and that's why this pain is happening. Or we can blame others. We can turn to anger and frustration and, and cast the blame on other people so that we don't really have to deal with the suffering that's in front of us. We can turn to drinking. We can turn to self-destruction. We can go to all kinds of different places so that we forget what's really in front of us, so that we run from it, so that we escape from it. But the call of Scripture is a call to stay. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 and 16 it says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Praise God that you bear the name of Christ. Because we don't need to run. We don't need to escape. We don't need to feel shame and guilt and hopelessness because there is a hope. Glory is right around the corner. And no matter what the path you're walking on today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, glory is right around the corner. And no matter the, the shadow that, that's surrounding your life right now, glory is right around the corner if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. I came across a, a prayer this week that was written by noted Christian author Jerry Bridges, and he wrote this prayer the week that his wife died. This prayer has challenged me greatly, and, and I want us to, to spend our remaining moments focused in on this. He says, Lord, I'm willing to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict, and to be what you require. There is a simplicity in this prayer that just says, I'm willing to stay. And if there's something I'm lacking that, that he's withholding, I'm willing to stay. And if there's something I'm holding on to that, that he wants to take, I'm willing to stay. And if there's some suffering that, that I don't want to experience, I'm willing for him to inflict it. And if there's something he's asking me to be, but, but I don't want to because it's too difficult, I'm willing to be what he requires. Inside your program on your sermon notes are those four questions listed there at the bottom. And I want you to reflect on these. And I want you to notice that each of those four questions that are asked can be turned into a statement. Which one of those statements do you need to make today? I want you to reflect on that, and you'll have a chance in your connect groups this week to, to talk about that in your group. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I'm willing to lack what you withhold. And so the question for you is, is what is God keeping me from that, that I need to be content with? And maybe it's a job situation. Maybe you're sitting in a job right now and you know that there are other options. You know that, that, that there are greener pastures, but you're so frustrated. You're so upset with what's happening at work and you just need to learn to be content. And maybe you need to say, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen with this job thing, but I will walk whatever path you put in front of me. Maybe it's a relationship. Some of you here, more, more than anything, you, you long to find a spouse. You long to, to find the love of your life. You feel lonely. And you know that's the desire of your heart. And so maybe today, you just need to say, Lord, I'm willing to lack what you withhold. And if this isn't going to happen, I will be content in you. And if this is going to take some time, I will find my fulfillment in you. And maybe the statement you need to land on is, Lord, I'm willing to relinquish what you take. And so the question for you is, is what do I need to surrender to give God full control of my life? Maybe it's your future plans. I imagine that there are some of you in here who, who you've charted out your future. You've got a 10-year plan, a 15-year plan in place, and, and you know what you want to do and what it's going to take to get you there. But you've noticed recently that the Lord has begun to, to drift you off that course. And there's a fight that's broken out between you and God. Because you don't want to relinquish the future that you envisioned for Him and for His glory. 
And today he's saying, you need to give that up. You need to trust me. Maybe it's your finances. Perhaps money has enslaved you and you need to say, Lord, my money's yours. I've been selfish. It belongs to you. Maybe for you, you need to land on the statement, Lord, I'm willing to suffer what you inflict. And I know, at least for me, this is the toughest. This is the most difficult. And, and so are you willing to ask the question, what painful situation am I avoiding right now that God's calling me into? Well, what's the suffering that you've been running from or that you've been avoiding at all cost? Maybe there's a life-changing decision that needs to be made, and you know it needs to be made, and you've known for a long time. But you're scared. You're avoiding it at all costs because you know that, that if I follow Christ, if I walk down that path, that there's going to be suffering. Maybe there's a relationship you're in, and it's a toxic relationship. And you know that it needs to end, but you're scared to death because you're afraid you'll be lonely. You're scared to death because you're afraid it'll be too painful. But you know it's the thing that needs to happen. Maybe it's bigger than that. I realize in a room this size that there is some deep pain that's present. And some of you, you've, you've lost a loved one. You've, you've lost someone very close to you who, who's passed away, and, and you've never really allowed yourself to mourn because you filled your life with busyness so that you could escape, and you never experienced what God had for you in that moment. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're mad at God, and you're asking, why did he allow this? Why did I have to walk through this? And your heart is bitter. Or maybe it's someone who, who's hurt you deeply and you don't want to forgive them. You want to hold on to it. You're holding on to anger and frustration and, and because of that, you're just going in this cycle. Maybe today is the day you say, Lord, I'm willing to suffer what you inflict and if the path you've called me to leads to suffering, I'll go there. I'll stay there. I'll walk through that. Or maybe today, real simple, you just need to say, Lord, I'm willing to be what you require. And the question you need to ask is, what is God calling me to be as his follower? You know what that is. Maybe it's a, a sin that you've been hanging on to for, for a really long time, and you know that there's just a part of your life that you don't want to give up to him. But you know who he's asking you to be. You know what he desires. And so maybe today's the day you say, Lord, I'm willing to be what you require. I'm willing to follow you regardless of the consequences. For some of you, maybe that's just the very first step of, of, of saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for my sins, and I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Which one of those statements do you need to make? Which one of those questions do you need to ask yourself? Which one are you going to hang on to? Because for every one of those, we have a choice. And that choice is, should I stay or should I go? I pray you'll stay. I pray you'll say, Lord, I'm willing to stay right here because I know that when I stay, you mature me, you grow me, you change me. I pray you, you say, Lord, I'm willing to stay because I know that when I stay, that I become like you and identify with your son Jesus. I pray that you say, Lord, I'll stay because I know that glory is right around the corner. And no matter what I walk through here on earth, it in no way compares to the glory that awaits us. I'm going to stay. Will you stay? Let's pray.